Join me, Thomas, on a full review of the all-new Porsche 911, the 992, so the code word says. We have different colors for you, a tour on exterior, interior, and the driving experience, racetrack, and normal road driving. And we'll also compare the rear-wheel drive model versus the four-wheel drive model. And I will tell you what I mean by this car here tries to be as analog as possible with all digital means it has available. What I mean by that? Let's find out in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. Think about being a designer of a Porsche 911. On the one hand, you can design a car which is drawn like this by every child and it's, you know, everyone's dream car it has this typical silhouette. On the other hand, if you do something wrong, millions of people want to lock you up. <laughs> well, and so they came to the decision to keep this one here more in an evolution, but they added some retro elements. For example, you can see that the front hood is now cut out in a more rectangular way and this is you know reminding like some other details especially of the 1970s Porsche 911 models i think you know it's quite a nice idea idea to go a little bit more retro again also the lower air intake graphics have been changed and size wise this car has mainly grown in width so 4.5 centimeters in the front both and in the back do you see that i think you do a little and if you compare it to the original 911 this one here is basically <laughs> almost double the size now. You still have now whew, round headlamps. Yeah, we've been on that subject already. <laughs> don't, don't ever change them again. But you can get now the LED from standard, but also this one's here, the LED matrix lights. Those ones are the optional top trim lights. And they always have this four dot design as for the very bright daytime running lights. And here we also have a direct comparison for you with the all new model and the predecessor. So what's the difference? Yeah, as I said, the main difference is really how the front hood has been cut out. Like this here, it is still round. And well, this one here is wider, as I said, but I'm not sure if you can really see that. I mean, a couple of centimeters, you don't really see that with your own eyes, but maybe it will change something with the driving. So which one do you like better? The old or the new one? The car has gained 2 centimeters in length, that means 4 meters 52, 14 foot 8 or 178 inches. And here we go with the side silhouette of the all new 911. It hasn't changed too much. The window line is a little bit lower than before. We will soon also see that again with the comparison to the predecessor model. Important change is that it has mixed wheels, that means in this case here, 20 inch in the front and 21 inch in the rear so the rear ones are bigger those rims style i really like that those ones are the spider rims so to say it has this you know 90s bbs style that's totally my style <laughs> is it also yours here also in india red today but we also showed you also some other colors today we also have a silver car and also a yellow car on location but of course there will be more color choices on the world premiere we also showed you a thomas blue car for example already 
And as for the suspensions, there's the standard one with the PASM. That's the adaptive suspension already. There's a setup with the same one, but 10 millimeters lower. That's the one we're driving here today on the road. And then there's the optional anti-tilting function, dynamic chassis control. It's a little bit confusing because in the same Volkswagen Corporation, usually DCC stands for the adaptive suspension, but here it stands for the anti-tilting function. You know, pretty confusing. They obviously can't uh, <laughs> really find a solution to have, uh, you know, one naming for everything. So here again, PASM is a adaptive suspension and the dynamic chassis control, that one is the anti-tilting function. I wonder that, that a sports car is offering that even, you know, it should be actually stiff enough. What do you think? Two more details here. The car is 50 kilograms heavier than before, although there have been some weight savings on some elements, also more use of aluminum. But as more technology comes into the car and also more filters for the exhaust system and so on, so more clearing of the exhaust, it also gains in weight still. We'll see how that one plays out for driving. And there are those new door handles. They look more integrated, of course, in the car and it's also better for the wind efficiency. But when you grab them, you know, first of all, they're a little bit hidden. Um, when you use the key, they fold out just a little bit, then you can grab them easier and then you just pull them up. But somehow, you know, the like the haptical feeling, the tactile feeling here, hmm, it doesn't keep up with the rest of the fascination of the car. Somehow it felt better with the classic door handles. Introduced with the 911 Turbo S of the predecessor generation, you can again go for an option for the rear axle steering. That means that at lower speeds, the rear wheels can turn in the opposite direction of the front wheels to reduce the turning circle and to increase agility at lower speeds. At higher speeds, it goes in a parallel direction then to give you some more stability at higher speeds. And another option are those carbon ceramic brake discs for front and rear, well, they're really, really expensive and they make sense when you go on the racetrack with the vehicle. If not, you can also just live with the standard ones. Side profile comparison, 991 and 992. Well, approximately it's the same, but if you look in detail, the window line here is a little bit higher than in the new model, the new model, an even slimmer look. I really have to say, when I saw this the very first time at the world premiere, I was a little, little bit skeptical about the design, but it really grew on me and it really, you know, took a like on those retro elements also, you know, at the rear part right there. At the same time, it looks a little bit more elegant still, so stronger but more elegant because there are somehow less individual parts. Then there goes an LED stripe all around the vehicle. This is also one of the new elements so far. The all-wheel drive model had that. And also the all-wheel drive models had the wider rear here, or also the GTS. Now all come with a wider rear. Again, about four and a half centimeters wider than before. So it makes a stronger appearance. There are different exhausts available. This one here is already equipped with the optional sports exhaust. And one interesting detail for sure, the 911 writing here. This is also a retro font. However, I have to say that the badge at the predecessor model looked a little bit more elegant. That's again, you know, <laughs> whatever you do, every detail gets noticed with the 911. That's also what's so fascinating about the vehicle. For sure, also this third braking light, which is integrated in those vertical fins. And I also think that the integration of the rear wing is really well done because when it's close, I think it's really, you know, just one, almost one piece, looks like one piece. And when it goes up, of course, it always looks a little bit weird. It does it automatically at higher speeds or if you induce that with a button right in the infotainment screen. And there's always a lot of discussion about what is a fake exhaust. For example, is it one... Or is it not when the exhaust fumes still go through this tip here? But what's clearly to say is that the outer tip here is just for beauty and the real exhaust is on the inside. By the way, don't you also think that when those rear wing applications here, when they are put up, doesn't it look a little bit like one of the old 911 turbos with the famous, uh, famous duck tail end? 
the so-called Entenwurzel in German. And here for you also the direct comparison of the predecessor model in the rear to the new one. Here of course the biggest change as you can see now once again is this light stripe that goes all the way around the new vehicle and the whole rear looks more massive. It's again it has become wider and also especially this upper area looks more massive than in the outgoing model. Again which one is your favorite here as for the rear? So what do we have here? This is a rear wiper. And I really have to say, it looks pretty weird on the vehicle. Of course, it looks more streamlined without it. However, for the, re for the view to the rear, of course, it comes quite handy in heavy rain. Hmm, but still, would you go for one? So I already talked about the door handles, but what about the door closing sound? Mm. Not the most convincing one, right? So a lot of things this car does great, but door closing sound maybe not. Then you can see everything is wrapped tightly. That's the interior scheme of the 911. Has always been some small carbon inserts right there, or at least carbon style. Then those inside door handles has been have been redesigned, memory seat function as well. There are different seat options as for the general layout. Those ones here are the adaptive sports seats, so with a lot of electronic controls. Also with the full animal skin wrap, but I'll soon also show you an alternative. All new is also the steering wheel and the whole front cockpit. See this steering wheel, we haven't seen that before. It looks a little bit darker than before. It doesn't have some chrome accentuations. And also those digital instruments behind it. Just the analog RPM meter in the very central. That's classic. Everything else just around it is digital. And it's also inspired. You see, it's a little bit drawn back and inspired by 1970s Porsche 911. And soon also more to the other digital screens. Let me get inside. And this one is the reason why Porsche is meanwhile selling more SUVs than sports cars. In China even, Porsche is known as an SUV brand, not primarily as a sports car brand. Not like in Europe where Porsche has and also in the US where they have this sports car heritage. Still, the 911 remains an icon and you sit low as you would expect from a sports car. But again, more and more people would say, Oh, you know, I'd rather sit high, high and upright like in a Macan or in a Cayenne or something. This one is still the true sports car deal, so you have this sports car seating position. Also fitting for taller people? Well, I'm 1m86 or 6 foot one and that leaves me plenty of headroom here. They've also increased that here in the new generation. And, you know, those are sports seats here, I mean, they are sports seats and this is not like, you know, a very small sports car, but it's also not something where you would say, ah, you know, I want to spend my next road trip with. At least not me. There are surely some people who say, you know, I spend hours and hours and hours and hours in my 911. But to, to me, I have to say, I mean, it's just because of the building form of the car that the comfort is, of course, somewhat limited. If it wouldn't, if, you know, if there wasn't any limited comfort, Porsche also wouldn't build any SUVs. So, then the steering wheel is in this lower electric control like this it can be put up and down and also inward and outward take some time but you can surely find your driving position and there are a lot of controls right here so this is far from being minimalistic or something you have the driving mode selector on the lower right part everything has a very nice clicking sound and for example the volume control on the left side and the ACC is right here. The ACC is an option by the way, but the autonomous emergency brake finally is from Stan Equipment. So you have this safety um, net as well. And this is also one thing they have 
also uh, you know um, update all of the assistance systems here in the car and i think that's also one of the very important aspects because yes you can say as a purist you just want you know steering brake acceleration and that's it and no helpers yeah i can really understand that and it has of course a justification on the other hand let's say you know some famous actors died in a 911 in the old ones maybe they wouldn't have in the new ones with a safety net with more safety features and so on so it's just you know about safety also it also has a reason they go a little bit away from the purest approach and make the car more modern with more assistance systems better crash safety rating and so on so you often always have to you know take a look at both perspectives and both somehow have truth in it in the interior overview here, well, usually Jonas, who is doing the filming today, heads off to the great images here. Usually he's right there behind me and then filming from the rear to the front. It's hardly possible to do that here today. So here's it at the side door, but I think it also gives you a very nice image. Here again, you can see how the interior, the cockpit here, the instruments, a little bit drawn back. Then we got also this, you know, you could serve some food here as well, right? <laughs> With some carbon fiber style here too. Inside a 10.9 inch screen is also a little bit drawn back right there that you can also see it at brighter sunlight. And again, this scheme that everything is wrapped tightly here also with the leatherette surface. On top of the dashboard, there is, if you have the sports chrono package, most will probably go for it, this analog clock. And in this lower middle console, you can see here driver and co-driver are still split very much. And we have nice metal knurling with those buttons. You have hotkeys actually here, two ones you can set your favorites to. This one here is the button for the PDCC. So I talked about the dynamic chassis control earlier. They at least added a P to it, so they can name it Porsche dynamic chassis control. This one again, the anti-tilting function, you can set it to two levels, then that it gets a little bit stiffer. Continuing further down the middle console here, again, um, nice metal knurling also for the climate unit with clicking sound. And then, you know, if you forgot to shave, they have integrated this brown shaver here. So, and then you can, you know, just get ready while you're driving to work or something. And, well, I mean, there have been some discussions about the uh, new shifting lever. On the one hand, it looks clean, of course. And it makes it, let's say, you know, a little bit more subtle. On the other hand, you know, <laughs> you're thinking like, shaver, shaver, shaver all the time when you look at it, <laughs> don't you? Um, I'm not sure yet. So I like that it has basically a clean design. But then I think, you know, how control you could you push it backward in the D mode, forward in the R mode, but then the P mode is here. Um, I'm not sure if it's like the most intuitive or best. Uh, tactile feeling or something it you know it's summer I, I'm not really sure like should I do it like this or like this or like this or like this I don't know so um, I have to get used to it first but somehow I don't think it really fits to a sports car what do you think <laughs> so nice that you could discuss so many details of this vehicle once again and if you continue further there is a new cup holder situation here um, this can also just be an, you know, an open cubby hole, this is possible, but also a cup holder. Then we have an electric parking brake. And last but not least, there is this armrest. And then you can store the smartphones in here and have also like uh, two USB supplies where you can recharge stuff. So what about this cup holder situation? Let's open the glove box and hey, here it is, I got one. And then we can just pull out the normal cubby hole and put in the cup holder then we have the central cup holder here for the driver it's also adaptive a little bit and you can also remove it again with this lever so to say and wait a minute before there were two here one here and the other one worth there wait a minute uh -huh. there's the second one so this one here on the left side was removed and put to the central one you can still have one right there. And one more detail, look at those instruments and look ones right there. We need to have that in a Porsche, but digital speed in the small part there. And then you can change basically what you want to have in both left and right screens. For example, on the left, you can have um, just the speed information, but also navigation info. You can switch it around then hit the key at the 
steering wheel again and switch around what's on the right screen. Um, for example, the GPS view or also GeForce Meet or here, this is, um, you know, um, uh, just to watch, like, you know, um, to stop the time, stopwatch, then the GeForce Meter, tire information, the pressure, or here also in which driving mode you are in at the moment. So you're, so you're pretty flexible. You know, I'm always also a friend of analog instruments, but the digital ones, they clearly give you more information and you can switch around where you want to have the information and at which time. This new 10.9 inch screen right there, it's a touch screen. You can see here it's also pretty responsive. A nice map view. By the way, you can have the Apple CarPlay and uh, not Android Auto in this case because Porsche is still limited to Apple CarPlay and I also want to play my music of course and at the same time I can still use the car internal set nav that would also be very important to me of course. You can still connect your phone via Bluetooth if you want but here it automatically leads into the CarPlay if you have the cable connected. Climate details can also be accessed right there because where the winds are coming from, that you have to do here in the menu, but still temperature and the vent strength can be controlled manually down there. What else is important here at the car view, that's where I put out the spoiler manually. Here I can also activate the exhaust system, which is automatically done by the sport mode, for example. You can see here, then it's automatically, ooh, wow. <laughs> and the PDCC, so you can have like stiffer response from the uh, dampers even and it keeps the car even more upright. That is also then done. You can see how I changed it with the button and also then changed in the screen. And a new wet driving mode. So sensors in the wheel arches realize when it's wet and then tell you, ah, you know, why don't you go to the wet mode? However, you can also just do it manually and put the wet mode yourself and then the car is more controllable, less torque is being applied to the wheels and stuff. Might be useful in rain indeed, especially for the rear-wheel drive model. We have indeed right here for the all-wheel drive models, maybe less important. Most of you guys will know that the Porsche 911 just has emergency seats at the rear compartment, but for the sole purpose of people being able to tag me, Thomas, in the rear seat at time code whatever, <laughs> just for this reason, I'm trying it out. I know you guys like to do that with small cars or sports cars. Um, in this case here, I tried several things out, but it doesn't slide forward automatically. Maybe because I think no one gets in there anyway. So we slide the electric seat now forward and a little bit upward. And um, you can see, well, people can sit there. It is also possible with the Isofix for the child seats. That's maybe the best use of it. Or, of course, using it for luggage. Um, that's how I do it like here. Um, I'll also soon soon show you can do it with the same on this other side and then you can put bags on here without um, you know damaging the seats or something so that's definitely um, a good thing to be able to do other than that let me get inside like this and what's clear is I mean theoretically I can sit here but doing like this I feel like a dwarf I feel dwarfed in so to say and there couldn't be you know a real driver here then now. Um, I did some experiments however here now with the co-driver seat because I've set the co-driver seat to let's say the position I could sit I could still sit there but with the minimum amount of amount of leg room. Um, then let me try if I can fit in behind the co-driver seat because that would be the only solution to me. Um, That's it. Uh, no. Even that, well, when I put my knee now at the side here, theoretically when someone wants to drop me off at a train station or whatever, and we drive them with three adults right there, but you know, that's the maximum you get. I mean, <laughs> it's of course not cozy for me, but I think it's always funny for you to see for sure. And then you also get in, you know, a better understanding of how much or how less space we have here. But of course we're going to show you again how it looks like when we have both of those rear parts flipped then you have even more room right here. So you know like for a sports bag or something which is then also secured because you put the front seats right there. Um, you know you can use this for some additional luggage for sure. 
I'm not sure if you put things up here, it might be a little bit unsafe that, you know, falls, um, falls over, flies to the um, cabin or something. Um, I don't know, maybe a hat or something or for a jacket, that still works. There were some epic pictures or something where people tried to, you know, were posing with a 911, like with luggage at the rear, you know, where the engine is. Or I mean, like say, oh, let's take a look under the hood and then trying to look at the front hood, but that won't happen on an automotive channel. We all know the real hood right here in the front is the one for the luggage compartment with the 911. And you can open it with the key or from the inside of the car. And you can see, well, on paper, the liter capacity is just 135 liters. However, you can see a backpack and a cabin trolley does fit in here. It can put in like this. Not like this, then the hood would not be closing anymore. But in this way it does fit, so it gave you also a good impression of what it can handle. And here I want to show you those special retro seats with fabric on the inside. Those ones are also the seats I would go for. You can see here there's fabric on the inside on the lower part and also on the higher part. And then there's a mix of leatherette on the outside and some still animal skin parts. So there's a mix of all three materials. This one then of course has the advantage less animal material which is always good and also practical advantages because it stays cooler in summer and it also stays warmer in winter. And when you sit on it, especially for example on the racetrack or when you go a little bit faster, what you might want to go in the 911 or in the corners, it's also a little bit stickier. You don't slide on that material that much as you would do on the animal skin. And the same also goes for the rear compartment here. Same fabric material. And it's actually feels quite good indeed. And still, you know, um, robust in a way. And we also have a sneak preview for you how the new generation looks like as a convertible. Of course, the front all the same, also the interior all the same, and the very rear also, but just, you know, the side profile, of course, and when you look from, you know, just from, you know, from, from the edge of the rear. And the interesting thing is here, due to this stronger rear now in the new generation, I think it's also a little bit stronger even with the convertible and I'm not quite sure about the design there right yet because you can clearly see that line right there. Do you like it or not? As for the facts and figures, acceleration wise this car is a little bit heavier, about 70 kilograms than the Coupe, so this will be 0.2 seconds slower in the acceleration figures. Of course, won't be such a difference you would feel. It's more the difference that is on paper. The roof is now a little bit faster than in the predecessor generation. It's about 12 seconds to open or to close it and still up to a speed of 50 kilometers an hour. And let me show you some wheel designs. This one here is the one we had on our main red vehicle with a spider design, all 21 inch rear tires here. Then below that, a little bit brighter one, a little bit more space. So if it's more your style, that one, for example, or a quite similar one, but then with dark accentuations, also very interesting. And I found that one also quite cool. This one here, the retro style, for sure you find those here on the older 911s. I think it always has something. We've also seen that one recently for the Macan. Welcome to our racetrack experience. We're here in the 4S, so the all-wheel drive model, but I did my initial laps also with the rear-wheel drive model, so I can tell you soon more about the differences. We we'll start with the sport mode first, more exhaust sound, a little silver suspension, more throttle response and later shifting up with this 8-speed PDK. That's a dual-clutch transmission, as we know, 
from the Porsche models. This car also equipped with the rear axle steering and it goes two degrees across or in the parallel direction depending on the speed you're driving. And we also have a Sirius 911 in front of us. And there you can also see the rear spoiler going up and down depending on the speed. And the threshold is 90 kilometers for the first level and 150 for the second level, but it's always checking out other um, stats and then according to the situation the rear wing changes but those ones are the approximate speed figures so we're starting again in the sport mode also have the all-wheel drive meter and I see when I really hammer the throttle I can see that more and more torque is being brought to the front wheels so especially when accelerating out but we have a lot of grip here anyway so the rear drive model was also doing really great for sure. We'll steadily pick up the speed more and more. This one here, tight corner. This here, the Circuit Ricardo Tormo near Valencia. Also hearing more of the sound now. So this car also equipped with the PDCC this anti-tilt control and you really feel it this new generation just keeps upright all the time it it doesn't tilt at all even in those um, rather hard corners that's really astonishing so that was 240 kilometers an hour now. I think that's like about 150 miles or something. So really also reaching some high speed stuff right there. Now hard on the brakes. So we're going to pick up the speed. Drifts me a little bit outside. Car's really neutral and stable. I feel that the car is a little bit heavier than before. Well, not really, because it is sportier than before still, because they have picked up the suspension game. It is somehow more comfortable, but at the same time, it's definitely sportier because this anti tilting control is just keeping the car steady and upright. I mean, you should surely be able to see that also on camera, that there's hardly any serious tilting. Is really astonishing. The power, power figures as we have from the GTS and the predecessor model. So, although this is just the S version, so one version basically is uh, above the base model, it already feels like a race car. I also like what they've done with the steering. So, you see that I don't have to steer that much. I can always keep both hands at the steering. That's just 10% more direct. I can just agree to that. I have a very precise feeling of what's happening to the car. That's really cool. Tight corner again. This is um, also used in the MotoGP course. go to the Sport Plus mode. Let's see how that changes the handling of the vehicle. When I shift up now, I get like a hammer, you know. So the shifting process is more notable for sure. That's a difference. The stability control is drawn back just a little bit. So I can get a little bit more loose. That's especially important for the all-wheel drive model here. So, now the next corner here. A little bit on the packs here. So, what I feel as a difference from the two-wheel drive to the four-wheel drive model. Um, of course, you get a little bit more traction, when, especially when accelerating out. Um, 
in the two-way drive model, when I switched from Sport to Sport Plus, I didn't feel too much of a difference. Here now, in the all-wheel drive model, I have to say that the difference from Sport to Sport Plus is more different. That's really interesting finding for sure. And it surely has something to do with the car with the four-wheel drive is more stable, more tends to understeer than to oversteer. And this then, of course, when you put in the Sport Plus mode and the electronic stability control is being drawn back, this makes the car a little bit more agile then. And in general, is there a big difference between the two-wheel drive and the four-wheel drive model? Well, here on the dry race track, the difference is not that much because both have a lot of traction and in acceleration this is also an advantage of the rear engine concept it gives so much weight on the rear axle that you can use all of this acceleration but i still have the feeling somehow that the two-wheel drive model let's say is a little bit more loose to drive of course the electronic stability control which we're supposed to leave on here keeps the car steady basically um, but somehow the two-wheel drive model felt a little bit lighter, but you can only really feel it on the racetrack. Uh, when you're driving on the, on the street, there will be hardly any real noticeable difference from that. But of course, on the street driving, it will be different when you're in snow or like very rainy conditions or something. So the four-wheel drive model then would be the more suitable, suitable one for everyday driving. But for the race trick, I think I will still go over the rear stuff with the two-wheel drive model. Although it still has a rear wheel bias, of course. Not sure if you can pick up the all-wheel drive meter here on the small action camera if you watch full screen. Then you can I've put it on for you. You can also see a lot of that. Me, myself, I cannot see so much because one of the disadvantages of those new instruments is everything right and left here, I can't see anything of it. That's a big disadvantage of this new layout. But especially here on the racetrack, the one thing I really need to see is the RPM meter, maybe, or just use my ears for the RPM meter I think that's basically also really enough for that. So if you hear, by the way, those rattling sounds a little bit, it's like from the key on the, in the middle console, like in the small armrest, because we have so much G-forces here that the key in the middle armrest, although it's basically now kept there, is flying all over the place, just in this very small cubbyhole. Not sure if how um, much you hear that really on, on the microphone here. And of course, pretty loud here in the vehicle, so it's not a very well insulated sports car and I mean thing is for sure also that you still want to hear that engine here. Although I think we can all agree that I mean the sound of the 911 has never been like a very roaring one if you compare it to other engines. It's also one of the sound characteristics of those flat engines. So, and especially sound, you know, in this new generation, if you ask me personally, it's not a really, really impressive one. Or what do you think if you heard it from the outside? I think even from the inside, maybe it sounds a little bit better than even from, from the outside. Very fast corner. Again, some stuff without comment.
So, and now to Thomas's driving lounge on the normal road with some say the true 911, the one just with rear wheel drive. That's how it's supposed to be, some say. <laughs> well, on dry roads, of course, there hasn't a big difference between the rear wheel drive and the all-wheel drive model. The all-wheel drive model has, you know, it can put some more traction on the ground, therefore it's also a little bit faster in the extra, extra range, but just a little bit. In wet driving conditions, of course, the all-wheel drive has an advantage, or in general in winter. However, with this wet driving mode here, you know, they also have the possibility to limit the power just a little bit. So, we've had it on the racetrack and saw the great performance, but can you also just use it as a motorway cruiser? That's the question here. And let's go on this motorway here to 120 kilometers an hour. The tarmac surface here is, you know, is quite fresh and good. However, it's also some, you know, rather rough for sure. Um, like the, the, you know, the, the fine structure. That's, that's what I mean. And at the moment here, driving mode wise, I'm just in the normal drive mode. I do hear something from the exhaust for sure. This is a sport exhaust, so it's a little bit louder than a normal one. And the noise insulation is here. You maybe also hear that. I do have to raise my voice um, significantly. So it's not that you would say it's a very, very silent sports car. The noise insulation is quite good, yes, but it's definitely that you still feel connected somehow to the noises this car generates, that's for sure. So it's not that you are totally insulated from, from the engine. You still hear that roaring there in, in the rear somehow, even here in the normal driving mode. You, feel, you may hear the difference now. I'm off the throttle. It gets re relatively silent. As soon as I'm just normally on the throttle, you hear some roaring, definitely. And also when you're going to the sports mode, then you still can feel it here on the inside of the cabin. Or you can just go to the normal driving mode and activate that exhaust singularly. That's is also possible. So when you're normally driving this car or for example here on the motorway, you can see a blind spot monitor is also being activated here in the side mirrors. That's always one of the good safety features you should def definitely go for. But you look at that side mirrors and you always see those very strong shoulders of the car. That is definitely something that makes you happy just in everyday driving situation. Oh, now I stay on this lane here. The, show you again the blind spot monitor here in the side mirror with those three orange dots definitely one of the helpful features you should go for and that's always the thing you know on the one hand the car still feels somehow a little bit analog and pure but then again you say I know those assistance systems they are pretty cool and they definitely help you um, also for example with the um, with the ACC um, that is also a good feature for sure, especially when you're on, on longer motorway trips or something. Um, however, you know, this um, separate column here at the steering wheel is always a little bit complicated. You have to activate it first with a click and then press forward to activate. Then the speed is always being kept to and also the distance to the car in front of you. Um, switching back, by the way, to the GPS while driving here, that's a little bit complicated. So you're driving here and there's like, oh, wait a minute, where's the GPS? Ah, there it is, there's the hot key on. Oh, and there's maybe the next intersection I want to take. So I think it's always a little bit complicated. Um, there's no real hot key for that left. However, probably I would use one of those um, adjustable hot keys, favorite buttons right there to put maybe the GPS on, you know, on one of the hot card keys there, that might be a good solution, or what do you think? So, yes, it can be used definitely also as a motorway cruiser. It still gives you a good feeling, but um, it's definitely not the most silent one. And yeah, that's also another practicability thing. So we put one of the bags at the back part of the seats here, and you see it doesn't hold it that tight. So. Um, Maybe there should be also some luggage solutions where you can maybe like put a tension belt over it or, or something like that. So if you have more luggage than it goes in the front, you always have somewhat of a problem to get it real secured in a way. Now we're heading 
onto some countryside roads that were that's where the car is definitely also at home and here you can see at about speeds of 70 kilometers now or like 30 40 miles or something that's an, of course also more silent however what i feel what is being reduced a little bit in the predecessor generation when you were going over some small cobblestones and something um, or some like very loose stuff then sometimes it was coming into the cabin like really loudly i think this one has been reduced just a little bit you also feel on the street that the steering has been made 10 percent more direct so even if you're just on the countryside road or something it always makes yeah come on do some little more slalom and don't let anyone watch you because people might think ah oh, is this guy crazy doing like some slalom uh, stuff there again or here in the roundabout you're always looking forward to the next corner that's for sure if i would close my eyes and you ask me are you in the predecessor or are you not in the, uh, in the new generation could i really tell well the difference is not that huge but you definitely feel that the span between sportiness and comfort you know maybe a little bit more comfort suspension wise and a little bit more sportiness on the other hand yes they definitely fine-tuned that because they had a good product to go from and then they could you know just make things a little bit better they definitely definitely did that um, so it is let's say another step forward if you compare it to the predecessor brakes of course those carbon ceramic brakes are <laughs> those decelerations here are nothing for them for sure but I always have to tell you the truth that if you think about you know driving the current model and think about oh do I have like a big change when I go to the new model do I have to go for the new model right now Nah, you don't have to do that you can also just wait a little bit and go for it later or something or just be happy with your um, with your current model so that wouldn't be something you know sometimes we have generation change between cars where you say it's completely different and you know the old one was not so good but the new one was great but here I think the differences are not that huge for sure we're also keeping up with the consumption for sure for you on this rather calm round and the thing is that on paper the consumptions drop and drop and drop also due to you know downsizing putting them to turbo and, uh, and and something like that but that's always on paper in reality the consumptions are usually not really lower um, we'll drive a little bit further I mean so far I didn't do any big accelerations or something definitely keep out for that so here now again a roundabout you see I can also drive it pretty calmly and it's still a lot of fun and the thing I probably like best about this new generation is that the suspension brings you more comfort so and although we have the one here with the 10 millimeters lower so if you go for the standard suspension it should give you even some more comfort and I think that's definitely a very good thing so you can see always when I'm heading to the next intersection also this GPS screen then moves to the map however I'm driving this test track here uh, basically counterclockwise so um, that's where the GPS is always <laughs> suggesting new intersections than here oh that should be the almond blossom here right is it not those almond trees I think so right looks pretty neat so great evening sunset now nice countryside road those roads here are also very well made this is just pure auto fuel for sure with the 911 and you don't have to push it all the way to the max on the racetrack actually it feels so great you know here at this moderate speed with a new good suspension then this sporty hand you see here how precise steering commands are being transported and just enjoy this you know enjoy the sporty ride without going to the limits that's for me what this car is also about because when you think about a you know a 718 Boxster or Cayman with those cars you can better go to the limits actually because they have those midship engine concept and they are a little bit more aggressive this one here has more power on the one hand but on the other hand with the rear engine concept and this more GT kind of a character 
it's also good when you use it for, let's say, um, soft sport situations. We've seen this can be used hard on the race track, that's for sure. But still, it's just fun to cruise around it here in a you know, subtle, sporty way. And probably this will also be the thing that most owners will enjoy and do just from you know, day to day. I go to the sport mode here. Let's see and feel how that goes as for the suspension. It goes a little bit stiffer, so we got a little bit more response directly then from that. Um, then I can also put in here the, um, the PDCC for the anti-tilting function. And then the car is hardly tilting at all. It stays just flat. That's, that's really peculiar and it really feels strange. Um, it is not a small sports car, you know, so, but then in this setup here, it feels more agile and actually smaller than it actually is, so uh, that's pretty interesting. No way. And facing against the sun. Also a very nice road and <laughs> as soon as there is a straight, you always want to begin slalom, just a little bit slight slalom here because it's just so much fun to do it with the, with the vehicle, pretty cool. So I really like this GT character that they even stressed with this generation. That's I think you know what, what I feel um, what I feel most with the generation change with this car and driving it on the road, that's for sure. One thing that accounts to that is of course also the rear axis steering which this car is equipped with that also gives you more agility and more so to say, flow on the road, that's for sure pretty cool. Well, and now to the Sport Plus mode. You should not use it when the road is wet because the stability control is drawn back. The exhaust now is more active. We've heard of it, of course, more of it on the racetrack for sure. Whoa. Here you always have to pay attention, stay on the brakes. And then you can always use the acceleration if you wanted to because the car is always ready to give you that full power for sure. That's of course then again a lot of fun and those roads here are definitely perfect for this very vehicle. Ah, the brake pedal wants to be pushed really hard. Look at those orange is also very beautiful. Yeah, I think the, the steering setup has also been improved, not only more direct, and also gives you a little bit more feeling. So in the predecessor generation, some argue that it would have been too soft, so it has made a little bit stiffer here now. That's for sure also, um, you know, one of the aspects they could just fine tune. Wow. Yeah, really well done. Now again, hard on the brakes. But they really feel, again, more analog. You really have to hammer them through. So when you go back to the Sport mode, it's not that extreme. Sport Plus is, I think, rather for the race rig. The Sport mode you can also um, put in at countryside roads when it's dry or something. That's for sure pretty cool. So, this is about road driving. So, to me, yes, still a GT. Suspension, better, more comfortable power always there when you need it. Sound wise, yeah, I mean, that's definitely not as for the old big naturally aspirated engines, but you know, those flat engines always sound a little bit different. So um, yeah, I think we can all agree that it's not, you know, the um, most impressive sound or something. And seating comfort, this is also something I can criticize a little bit. Of course, it always depends on the individual body, but you know, I really think that for a lot of people a 911 will not be super comfortable on long term run. Yes, I know there are people who are going like the Alps down, up and down and all over again and they're totally happy. That's absolutely fine. But I can really say that for a lot of people it's just because of the building style. You know, it's still, you have to think about, it's still a sports car. You can use it for a lot of everyday driving stuff and there are even people transporting Christmas trees on top like the um, build, like the, you know, the sofa head of the building group of this uh, engine, August Achleitner, he's uh, now retiring. 
but we always you know have to be honest and tell you that it's of course not the most practical and as you always say no one needs one everybody wants one and that's of course so true with the 911 last but not least one more thing price well german price are clear already 120,000 euros for the um, for the s and 128 for the 4s and that's of course really expensive so yeah that's just Porsche they have the biggest sales margin in the whole automotive industry the only manufacturer that earns in a five digit figure per car true revenue per car five digit and that's of course because they're so expensive and yeah you're paying a lot for the name as well it's a great car for sure but it's for sure very expensive and I think also if you look at the internal competition with the with uh, you know a 911 versus 718 it's definitely too expensive i think someone has to say that at some point you know so many journalists are always saying like ah oh, you know 911 best car ever best car ever and, and by the way best car ever then they forget that there are still something else to criticize even with so great sports cars and in the very windy pit area let me take you on a tour of the history of the Porsche 911, starting with the 1963, the Porsche 911, the very first model. And you can see all the iconic shapes that has been carried out all over the heritage have been introduced here, for example, with the round headlamps and also this very strong design here around the headlamps. Same also goes for the interior with the round instruments and the horizontal stress of the whole dashboard. So-called F model as well. Then this one here, second generation, the so-called G model, was developed alongside safety regulations. You can see here the very strong front bumper, especially came those you know safety regulations from the US, even with some dampening, dampening mechanism here for the crash then in the front and for the rear. Also with an updated interior, Inter uh, interesting seats here also with integrated head restraints this one here the so-called g model this one also the very first one that had a turbo in the top trim spec then came the 964 the third generation here you can see it's more aerodynamic because this was was the dawn of the age of aerodynamics very interesting as for that with the very strong shoulders and this one here um, this basically has a chassis of the turbo you can see that here with the very very strong shoulders in this case and also again a more modern interior but technologically there haven't been so many changes well it has an adaptive rear wing also as for aerodynamics then the 993 the fourth generation this one was very interesting because it was the last air-cooled engine therefore also one of the most seeked after ones so this one here is you know becoming more and more expensive for sure i can tell you also again with the classic shape but you can see here the headlamp unit is a little bit flatter than it has been before a lot of people think that this one is the most beautiful one what do you think which one is the most beautiful one to you and then towards the 90s end of the 90s also Porsche was really having a struggle financial wise and so they decided to put the Boxster and the 911 on the same platform and also have those special headlamps um, this is also already the facelift it was yellow before and then it really looked you know like a, an, an egg in a pan so-called Spiegelei <laughs> headlamps in Germany um, so a lot of fans were not really keen on that one it was also the very first one that there was water cooled so a lot of new technology in this vehicle but at the end of the day you also have to see that this vehicle really saved Porsche because it was a financial success this one here the internal code for that is 996 this one here then is the 997 the sixth generation again with those round headlamps so they went back to that scheme fans really appreciated that technology wise this one was the first one with a pdk with a porsche dual clutch transmission there were automatic gearboxes before that but then they were converter gearboxes pretty interesting then moving towards the 2000s already now this one here the 
Now it's the predecessor generation as we have the all new model, this one here, the 991. And what's the main difference then to this one? Well, not sure if you can see it on the camera, the wheelbase has been lengthened. So this one here has a bigger stance in length on the road. Also some more room on the interior and of course all the infotainment stuff. This one, so more changes on the interior for sure. And finally, we get to the 992, the all new model. We have that full review here on Autogefühl and you can see that they went back to the retro styling, especially with the angular shaped front hood right there. You can find in one of the very early models. And now to our conclusion for today with the all new Porsche 911. Well, for sure it has been an evolution of the whole vehicle and you might think, hmm, is it just an extensive facelift or something? But then a lot of technological details have been updated. A lot of retro style also on the exterior. I personally liked it, but there has also been a lot of discussion about it. Of course, as soon as they change something with the 911, everyone takes a very detailed look at it. But that's also what we did here with our full review today. The interior has also been digitalized mainly. This is also the, you know, the key development right there. Other than that, it has you know, remained relatively the same. Also from the space it offers, of course, it's somewhat limited as being a sports car. The seat materials, we had one fabric seats, but of course they need to look even forward more than to introduce more sustainable stuff than that makes full sense in a full circle for a sports car that goes into the future, like they will soon also present with the Taycan with the electric vehicle. As for the driving experience, it has become even sportier than before and well, that was hardly possible, but it actually is. And at the same time, it's a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more direct and precise to ride. So they really fine-tuned the whole driving experience and they made it somehow even easier to drive the car. However, it still transports this iconic characteristic feeling, and that's what I meant initially by, that this car, although it's really fully digitalized meanwhile, is one of the cars that comes as close to delivering you, let's say, a classic vintage experience as far as it goes. So, what do you think about the all-new Porsche 911? Let's discuss this one in the comments, and please also join us next time.